up on the screen, I think is the simplest summary of what you need to figure out in module four, at least part A and part B, before you get into revaluations and tricky stuff. What we've got is this idea of a temporary difference that reverses, but nowhere in the study guide does it sort of say, here's what it looks like all the years, one after the other. So by building this table, what I hope to show you, and you'll see this in the webinar slides, we start the process and CA, the carrying amount, that's your accounting books, and then TB, that's your tax books, or it's the tax base. I like saying the accounting books and the tax books. And when it starts, there are 121, 20, things are equal. Now, some of you who've done the extra question will know if those two numbers are not the same at the start, it's not going to have a temporary difference. It's going to be permanent and you don't do anything for the tax. But here we start the process and the difference between the accounting books and the tax books is, is nothing. But if we depreciate at different rates, what's going to happen is there's going to be a temporary difference. So at the end of the first year, the, in the accounting books, the written down value will be 96. And the written down value for tax purposes in the tax books, the tax base, will be 90. So it's different. So, so it's not a complicated concept once it clicks into place. Okay, how different is it? It's 6,000 different. Okay, the next year it's 12,000 different. And this is where people can get stuck. If we ask you a question that says, what's the total difference? It's 12,000. If we say, what is the movement in one year? It's 6,000. It moved from 6 to 12. So you might be really good at your calculations, but you don't read the question properly. You get smashed because you answered the wrong question. So then we get from 6 to 12 to 18. To, now we're at $24,000 difference because over those four years of $6,000 of difference in depreciation. The closing balance for accounting purposes at the end of the fourth year is 24,000 written down value. But for tax purposes, you have fully depreciated this asset. Now, if you live in Australia right now, as part of Corona, the government has said, you can write off assets up to 150 grand, 300 grand, even more. So we have, this is a genuine issue for accounting purposes. You buy a new tractor, you can't write it off 100%. But for tax purposes, you can. That's government economic policy to stimulate investment. Big, big temporary difference. But what we see at the end of the life, in year five, we depreciate for accounting, but not for tax, because in the fifth year, there's nothing left to depreciate. And our temporary difference has reversed back to zero. So that's what we have. We have this big difference that reverses to nothing. So that's the five-year story. So I guess if you can use the thumbs up or the yes, I got it, or that time, we have different accounts and that reverse our time. And that's fantastic. So, so don't get stressed out by some of the fancy terms. Is it an FTA, you know, a future book taxable amount, an FDA future deductible amount? All of those things are just trying to help you build this table so you can compare carrying amount, accounting books, tax base, tax books, get the difference, multiply it by the tax rate, get your answer. Now, to properly understand Deferred tax, you have to understand the difference between these animals. And uh, so if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can remember what I am talking about when I show you this image. And you'll see we use images a lot. I use chickens and eggs and I use this because this very quickly explains what a conceptual framework is. So if you know what the conceptual framework is, you should know that your brain straight away knew three dogs, one cat kind of similar in the pet, the mammal, the group. So dogs are one group. Even though they're three different dogs, they all sit in the same category. Add the cat, and then you've got the hedgehog, the porcupine, whatever it is. Not so good. Does that make sense to you? You might think I'm a fruitcake at this point. But the, the key point of this slide, is not really joking, it's trying to show you that we have deep knowledge of key areas. We know plants, we know food, we know animals. We know cars, and we should also know our accounting extremely well. And you should be able to look at something and say, that's an asset. 
that's a dog. Why is it not a cat? Well, it's obvious. It, you know, if I say, is it a liability or is it a provision or is it a contingent, you would say it's obviously a provision because it meets this criteria but not this criteria. I'm going to show you a cool image of that later. So a few less people gave me a thumbs up on that one. So you might be lost. That's fine. Go back and watch webinar one. So to understand module four, you have to understand your conceptual framework and why we do reporting. We report to provide useful information to the users so that they can make good decisions. So whenever we see an accounting standard, provision, contingent, disclosure, not disclosure, disclosing event, not disclosing event, PL, OCI, don't just learn the rule, under, understand why. It's about providing useful information. So the reason we don't put everything in the profit and loss is because some gains are not as good as other gains. How many of you have Bitcoin? And how many of it had it when it went up? And now all of a sudden it's half the price. If you had recognized those gains before you sold your Bitcoin, it's not the same as having real cash in your hand. So we want to separate the real stuff from the potentially good stuff. That's why we do accounting the way we do. And in module one, the conceptual framework ties in closely, especially like my focus today is on this deferred tax assets and liabilities, especially the recoupment of tax losses. If you don't understand your conceptual framework, you don't know why we recoup it the way we do. So you try and memorize it and it doesn't work. But there's every way you need to understand provisions, contingents, goodwill, and then module seven, impairments. So we are trying to do relevant faithful representation and those are my cool four images and you should know each of them as you're enhancing characteristics, a quick little test. So comparable, verifiable, timely and understandable. So the key thing now, once again, from module one is the definition of the asset and you need this for your DTA, your deferred tax asset. Why do we have it? A right to economic benefit. Now, if we don't have to pay tax in the future, then that is the same as a benefit. We don't have to make a payment. That's a good news item. Now, if that's come because of a tax loss, we lose money, so we pay less tax in the future. Great, that is good news. I mean, it's sad that we made a tax loss, but at least we get to pay less tax. Has the past event happened? Yes. Do we control the asset? Yes. So now we have deferred tax asset. This is why. Now, the next part, and we'll look at this in a moment once I've looked at liabilities, is can we recognize it or not? Different question, different set of rules. So now what about deferred tax liabilities? Well, a liability is a present obligation, so something we have now to pay out money, another or transfer an economic resource. We don't always pay out money. We sometimes hand over goods or services or substitute it for equity. But in the normal case, we pay off our debts. We transfer an economic resource. So if I have to pay out more tax in the future because of what has happened now, then I have a liability. It's a present obligation to transfer an economic resource. In this case, I'm going to pay tax as a result of my past events. So what might create a tax liability? Well, I gave the example before. The Australian government lets you write off your big capital purchases at the moment because of corona to generate more income. So they allow you to write it off now, which pushes down your taxable profits. You pay less tax now. You have more money in your hands now. Fantastic. But there's no free lunch. Yes, you paid less tax now, but you will have to pay more tax in the future to when the time comes. So you now have a present obligation to pay that tax in the future. So that's why we have this deferred tax liability. So income uh, increasing assets, reducing liabilities, but just as importantly, when we talk to first tax, we also have deferred tax expense. Now, sometimes people say, and, and it was just in Facebook, is it a DTI or a DTE? It's exactly the same account. It's like if you work for a business, you'll see GST payable and GST um, receivable. It's the same account. It's the money goes in and it goes out. So you could call it DTI slash DTE. Normally when there's a credit, credits are income. So they're good news for the business because they're going to increase our assets or reduce our liabilities. So we call it a deferred tax income, DTI. But when it's in debit, it's an expense because it's a decrease. So we're either depleting our assets or increasing liability. So if we are depleting a deferred tax asset with a credit or increasing a deferred tax liability with a credit, then we are going to have a DTI. 
DTE, a deferred tax expense. Now, those letters DTI, DTE are interchangeable, but that's the logic of having the expense on the debit side and the income DTI on the credit side. So is that making sense for you so far? Um, you just type maybe why or yep, or I got it. If you're totally lost, go, I'm, I'm lost. That's fine. Okay, lots of yaps. This is good. All right, criteria for recognition. This is what you need to understand for the deferred tax asset recoupment when we have our tax losses. Now, if you lose money, then with a tax loss, if you're allowed to carry forward, you have a deferred tax asset that will reduce your tax bill in the future. But do we recognize it? What, what I mean by this is, do we show it in the balance sheet? And the answer is, it depends on whether it meets the recognition criteria. Now, in the past, they were very specific. Is it probable that you'll get the benefit? Can we measure it with a reliability? Now, with a deferred tax asset, we can measure it easily. We take the tax loss, multiply it by the tax rate, and that's going to give us this, this benefit, right? But is it probable? Well, that depends on whether there's future profits expected in the future. Now, if you've looked at question 4.7, if you've looked at Circus Limited, Zebra Limited, we keep saying it is not probable that there will be any future profits. So when it says it is not probable, when it says there is no future profit, you have a DTA, but you're not allowed to recognize it. Why? It fails the recognition criteria. So that's the logic. So here we have an asset or a liability is recognized only if it provides information to the users that is useful. That's why it is this way. So if the existence is uncertain, well, it, we know a DTA exists, so that's not correct, or the probability is low, then we don't measure it and it might go in the notes of the accounts. That's why we give you these really complicated questions like question 4.7 and Circus Limited where each year, one, one time you don't recognize it, then the profits come along, then you do recognize it, stepping you through the process. Now, uh, my history over the last 20 years, I've worked with a lot of companies who have had distress. That's why I come along and help. And they do have lots of deferred tax assets because they've had lots of tax losses. And there really is a genuine need to reflect on this and go, are you ever really going to recoup those losses or not? So it's a critical question. This one has nothing to do to CTAs, DTLs, but it's module one and it's about fair value. And, and this, these, all these different ways we account, why do we use historical cost and fair value? That's weird. It's not weird. The conceptual framework is about providing the most useful information possible. And this little chart shows you that for fair value, level one is awesome. If there's an active market, we know the exact price. That's when you want to use fair value. Then it gets trickier because you can't always compare the asset. So for example, I have a fairly new car. I'll, I'll use a better example. Matt, who is doing the IT support behind me, if you've ever heard of the Subaru BRZ and or the Toyota 86, it's red, it's fast. And that's what Matt drives because he's in IT and he likes to go very, very quickly. Now, if you buy a, a 2015 Toyota 86 or whatever, you can get onto car sales and get pretty much the identical comparison. That's easy to do. And it's the fair value. Awesome. But I also have in my driveway, uh, like a 1994 Saab, uh, reverse doesn't work and neither does fifth gear and no starter motor. So the only way to get it starting is to roll it down a hill, jump start and then drive it around. Now it is a heap of fun, but you can't find an equivalent Saab on car sales to value it. It's, it's a unique item. There's a lot of unobservable inputs. What's it worth to me? Very hard to measure. So Fair value, measurement, accounting is all about what's the best number we can get. So next time you're driving a really fast car, you'll be thinking about fair value and the conceptual framework. So I hope that helps. Quick jump into module two. Once again, what's going on here? Conceptual framework, adjustable events, non-adjustable events. Uh, the number of questions I'm seeing by people who aren't reading the standard and the rules and the information really carefully shows me that they're going to have trouble because they're kind of guessing, oh, I think it's adjustable. I think it's not. There is no, I think, I think. There just is. It's either going to be adjustable because it meets a particular criteria of ex affecting the existing condition, or it's not. Now, the study guide tells you which ones are and which ones are not and which ones get disclosed. So it's not complicated One, if you take the time to learn it 
really, really well, capture the summary notes. So accounting, in some ways, FR, yes, it's very, very hard, but once you know it, the exam should be very, very easy because it's either adjustable or not. It's profit and loss or OCI. It's not, I'm not sure because I didn't learn it properly. So I use the chicken and egg for OCI and I'm sort of just jumping through some of these theory ones to bring us back to module four. People say, oh, how do I know where it goes? Well, it's really simple. In nearly all situations, when you buy and sell stuff, you put in the profit and loss because that's normal business. But then there are exceptions. Why? Because we, we don't count our chickens before they hatch. The information that arises here is not as reliable, not as useful, not as powerful because we think it's good news, but we don't always know. It's not fully confirmed. And so, for example, like the Bitcoin game I mentioned earlier, if you've got a Bitcoin game, is it for real? Uh, a, a friend of mine uh, started investing in Bitcoin a few weeks ago and I'm a little bit conservative. So I said, oh, you know, you've lost all your money. Um, and he goes, no, 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 no. They've shown, look on this app. They've showed you how much money I've made. But at the time, Bitcoin had been going down a lot and he was being given just false information. And then they started pestering for more money and more money. I'm like, that that's actually a scam website and you've been stitched up. So what he thought was awesome cash, me as a conservative accountant said, actually, that's worth zero. So that's kind of what we're trying to do in the PL and the OCI. And that's why. So if you're trying to remember um, which goes where and why, um, If you're trying to remember which one goes where, you might go, hang on, this is confusing. Why would an increase go to OCI and a decrease go to PL? It's very logical. When we have an increase, it's good news, but it's not confirmed because we've had a revaluation, but we haven't realized it. We put it into the holding bay, the OCI, other comprehensive insurance, not as pure as PL. But when profit and loss decreases, well, we're conservative. If we tell someone about a decrease, we can assume that it's happened. So we don't count our chickens before they hatch. We don't know if they will all come to fruition. So uh, let me know in the chat box once again, does that make um, does that make sense to you? Why we have these rules with OCI and p &L. So the, the one area where this really trips people up is like, oh man, you give me this tricky question. And then there was numbers and that was in OCI and then they made it more profit and then you transferred it to p &L. So if you read it really carefully, if you had foreign exchange gains, they sit in OCI because they are not real until they are realized. Then what happens is if you sell off your foreign operation, which was running in foreign currency, then the cumulative amount of exchange differences. So what you do is you put all the profit into OCI, all those gains, and then you reclassify it because now we know it's real. Now we know it was an egg and now it's a chicken. Slightly absurd example, but that's what's happened. It can now go into the profit and loss because we know it is real. Because if I tell those investors and I tell the bankers, I made this much money, I can actually prove it. There is cash in my bank to that amount. It's not just a made up number. Um, to the question, if the revaluation shows a loss, which also isn't confirmed, would it still be recognized in PL? So when you do regular revaluations, it might go to the PL. But in this case, because it's FX, all unrealized gains, all losses go to the OCI. So it'll sit in the OCI until it's locked in. So if we go back one, when we've got regular non current assets, we will take the loss to the PL, like property, plan, equipment, something like that. But with um, FX, we do both to the OCI. This is Goldilocks. Not too big, not too little, just right. And so <laughs> if you've watched the webinars, you'll get this. But I, I, I always want you to have this picture in your mind. If we have a liability and we know the amount and we know when it has to be paid, we call it a liability. It's the big chair. It's then if we have mm, the potential, the possibility of paying out some money, we don't know the exact amount. We don't know when. We have the little chair. We have a contingent liability. And if it's just right, something just in the middle. So if you've ever read Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Not too big, not too small, just right. Not too hard, not too soft, just right. Provisions fall into this category, all right? Not too much certainty, not too little. 
<laughs> Timing is fine. Amount is fine. Uh, if, yeah, do we transfer evaluation to PL after the sale of the asset? Um, if, if you're talking about a um, sale of a non current asset, then that, what happens? You de recognize, you sell an asset, you recognize the profit on sale or the loss on sale. Then you credit the asset, eliminate it from the accounts, de recognize. Then you debit the accumulated depreciation, eliminate that from the accounts. And then you either got more or less than where it had been depreciated to. So that will go to the profit and loss because it's been done. It's finished. It's real. It's been realized. So provisions. Why am I showing you provisions? Once again, I'm reinforcing this conceptual framework. So no legal obligation. This is fishy limited if you've worked through it. People always say, oh, I think it's this or I think it's that. It's not what you think. It's work through each part of the standard and then you'll always get the answer right. So this is why I say, in a way, FR is very hard to study. But if you know it, the exam is very easy. There's no ambiguity. It's yes or it's no. Um, so, you know, is there a present obligation? Is there a past spend? Is it probable? Is it reliably estimated? Tick, tick, tick. You can answer these questions in just a few seconds. But if you don't know your rules, you cannot easily get them right. This great table on contingent liabilities. All right. So if we have a present obligation that is probable, meets the definition of a liability. It's a specific type of liability, the provision recognize it if it's possible or present but not probable then no recognition but we do a disclosure and of course when we get to module five you will see that there's a slight exception we actually do recognize some contingents and therefore we also have to do the deferred tax on them as well so that's why i brought in that contingents deferred tax all come together so now module four again if you can have this picture in your mind whenever you do module four, the business has two sets of books, the accounting profit and the taxable profit. Now, if you want, you can keep a full list of sales expenses balance sheet for accounting and for tax. That's what's shown here. You know? and, and then it's really easy to tell the differences. Or instead of doing it like this, you can just do adjustments only for the items that are different. So you could say, here's my accounting profit. And the only real difference is here and here. So I'll take my 753,000 and I'll adjust for that depreciation difference and I'll adjust for the other expenses difference. So that's what we're doing. Accounting books are different to tax books because, and, and a good logic here is, the tax office does not trust businesses and the most obvious area is with employee entitlements. So for accounting, we look at accrued leave for sick leave, annual leave, and long service leave. And that is good business discipline to recognize these expenses have been incurred, but not yet paid. But think about this. If you're an accountant and you want to pay less tax this year, you could recognize an enormous provision for employee expenses. And then you get a great big tax deduction. And the tax office is like, I'm not interested in giving you a deduction unless you've paid out the cash. For some reason, I don't trust you. So the tax law often only treats an item once the cash has been paid. So we get these differences. Now, sometimes the tax office doesn't trust us. That's one area. Other times, like I mentioned earlier, the tax office is trying to help us invest in more capital equipment. So it lets you write it off really quickly so it's a great idea to buy it now, which means you spend money, which pour more money into the economy, keep the economy ticking over. So sometimes the tax office helps us and sometimes they ignore us. And we need to always read the case facts of a question to get it right. A big mistake students make here, they memorize a treatment and then they apply it no matter what. So income gets paid in advance and the question then says, for tax purposes, it's taxed when the cash is received. Okay, you treat it one way. But if the income is taxed when earned, that's a different treatment. So you can't just memorize, do this for every prepayment or do this whenever there's employees. You have to understand the case facts and adjust based on that question. So that's the number one area people get stuck. They say, look at this example and look at this video. They're different. And I'm like, yes, they are different you haven't learned the underlying principle of what you're looking at. We're looking at the difference between how accounting treats it and tax treats it, and then solve for that. Uh, so the question that's just popped up, 
Accounting profit is the profit and loss, which is not no uh, your I th that's module two. Accounting profit is just what happens in your total accounting books, and then taxable profit is what is happening in your taxable books. So um, the, that's the net profit. So it'll include OCI, whatever you want, everything's in there. So using the conceptual framework, we've gone from module one now back to module four. So I hope you think I haven't just wasted a lot of time, but we need to, in addition to recognize the amount of current tax that's going to be paid um, or refundable to any unpaid current tax, so if we haven't paid our tax, it's really simple. We have a present obligation to sacrifice future benefits or resources as a result of a past event, liability. Now, if we've made paid more tax than we needed to, so if we've paid more tax, we get ourselves an asset because we will pay less tax in future. It's a weird kind of asset. It's not a physical, tangible asset. It's not a chair, table or car, but it is the permission to pay less tax in the future. It's a bit like having a, a discount voucher. If you're gonna buy a car and it's $30,000 and I give you a voucher for 5,000 now, there's, there's nothing on that voucher other than it's gonna give you a $5,000 discount. It's still a benefit. It's a weird kind of asset, but that's how it works. And then also any tax losses, uh, something just weird on my screen, I reckon I've got Matt Essie being helpful. So how can I convince him not to touch the screen? <laughs> Maybe it was me. Any tax losses that can be carried back also get recognized as an asset, but only if it's probable we can get the benefit. So that's our conceptual framework in order. <laughs> oh, it wasn't Matt, so my weird computer is glitching. So here's our deferred tax table from the study guide. And here's an example. I keep using the same tractor example so you can visualize it. So we need to figure out the tax base. That's the tax books, right? Then we compare tax base with the carrying amount. That's the accounting books. So I actually think those steps are back to front. I would say step one, figure out the accounting books. That's the carrying amount. And now you might go, oh, is that really tricky? No, you do this every day. You put in the asset value and then you deduct any depreciation. So that's the carrying amount. Or if it's inventory, just put in the inventory value. If it's the uh, accounts receivable, whatever the value is in your accounts for accounts receivable, that is the carrying amount. Then we say, what is the amount we use for tax? Now there's fancy formulas, but more often than not, it's really obvious. If you buy a tractor for 120,000, that's the opening tax base. And then if you depreciate it every year at 30,000, then the, the closing, you know, you don't have to work out future deductible amounts and future taxable amounts. You can, but this table format solves it for you really quickly. Now we compare the two and that gives us the difference, right? 6,000, 6,000. And one mistake people make is to forget to multiply it by the tax rate to get the deferred tax. So that's what we're looking at. What are the accounting books? The tax books, the difference multiplied by the tax rate. And then we do our, our journal. Now here, I mentioned this earlier, is a DTE, DTI, where we normally debit to the expense because we've got an increase in the liability and we normally credit when it's uh, with a DTI, but those terms are interchangeable. So I started the seminar with this image. The tractor costs 120. What's the tax base? 120. What's the carrying amount? 120. What's the difference? Nothing. The difference keeps growing by 6,000 per year. So that's the movement per year. And then the total is 6, 12, 18, 24. And it reverses in the final year because there is no depreciation for tax in the final year because it's already fully depreciated, but we still have some accounting depreciation. They both end up at zero. And that's what we need to see, a full reversal of a temporary difference. So... The logic here as well, how do you know if this is a DTL or a DTA? Well, if we can depreciate greater for tax, if we have more tax depreciation, our profit from a tax perspective is lower than our accounting profit. If we have a lower profit, we will pay less tax than if our tax was based on the accounting profit. So if we pay less tax now, that's a benefit to us now, but we're gonna have to pay that off more tax in the future. So deferred tax liability. Now, when will that tax liability be dealt with? In this final year, because in this final year, we're getting a reversal 
So DTLs will grow up, up, up. And then in this final year, our tax depreciation is zero. So it doesn't depress our profit in the final year. Our profit is going to be higher than our accounting profit because there is no depreciation. So in each of the first four years, our taxable profit will be lower. And in the fifth year, we'll have to pay it all back, deal with that DTL, satisfy that DTL. Does that make sense? So that's why you'll see DTLs go up, 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 and then they reverse, they get eliminated. All right, seeing some yeses, that's fantastic. All right. So uh, I talked about this before, how do you know if it's a, um, yeah, you will, you'll reverse that detail in the final year. It'll naturally happen because in this one, we're going to have our um, deferred tax expense and our DTL will go up and up and up. And in the final year, uh, that DTL will come down and it'll disappear. You need the carrying amount. This is my summary. You need to get the tax base. Um, yeah, there'll be a journal entry. There'll be those um, those reversals. So what, you'll see it in some of the calculations. What what, and that's why we always talk about the movement. So what's going to be in this case, what's the movement? So in this year, the movement was 6,000 DTL, 6,000 DTL. And in this case, the movement is a DTL down 24,000. So it'll be a debit to that DTL. So here, uh, a simple example, which I've, I've talked through, you need the carrying amount, we've got that, you need the tax base. So if we're accounting the motor vehicles 20,000 written down value, for tax purposes, it's 10,000. Is it a taxable or deductible temporary difference? So in this case, less tax paid now because we depreciated it faster, more tax paid later. So this is a taxable difference. So that's how it's going to work. How do we work that out? Then take our temporary difference. Do not forget this step in an exam, of course. In a multiple choice question, one of the options will be the right temporary difference not adjusted for the tax rate. So multiply by the tax rate, and there we go. We have a 3,000 deferred tax liability. So we have a DTE going up and a credit to our DTL. Uh, I wouldn't use the DTLs and the DTAs. You, you can interchange DTE and DTI, income and expense. That's the same account. Um, the, the debit DTL, DTA. Um, when you look in the balance sheet, sometimes they're netted off. Um, sometimes they're disclosed separately, but um, it, it, you could create a mess. So for me, if I'm doing my own proper accounting books, I'm just going to call it debit, deferred tax, credit, deferred tax. I'm going to call it asset or liability. And that one account will keep track of all the movements. But for, for this subject, I'd say keep your DTAs and DTLs um, separated. So here's this weird thing, the future deductible and future taxable amounts. Don't panic when you see this formula. What it's trying to say is go and work out that tax base. Now we kind of know how to do it anyway. Here's my tractor. I paid 120. Take away the depreciation. That's my tax base. It's pretty simple. 99% of the time, just I would use it, just a table and some logic to figure it out. Another way we're saying it is our tax base is our carrying amount, what we paid for it, 120. What are we going to deduct in the future? And what is a future taxable amount? Now, future taxable amount is a really weird name. So one of these relates to the tax um, effects and one relates to the accounting book effects. And that's why there's a difference here because for accounting purposes, we're going to do, uh, still deduct 96,000, but for tax purposes, 90,000. So that's what's causing the, the confusion. So our future taxable amounts are what's going to be dealt with in terms of the carrying amount of the asset, whereas our future deductible amounts are relating to what has to be adjusted for our accounting purposes. So I, I won't go through it in huge detail because I do explain it in the webinar recording, but you see this. Grab the carrying amount, work out how much is still going to be deducted for tax purposes, like how much of that written down value is there still to go, and then how much is there for the accounting purposes, now, in a lot of times, it's exactly the same. And in that case, uh, the tax base and the carrying amount are going to be equal. There's no temporary difference. So we work through this example. But that's what we're looking at. But I think using a logical table is going to get you there much more easily than wrestling with these concepts. 
in terms of the exam, it's unlikely you get a question 4.6 or 4.7. You can get a snapshot within that one year, or one journal entry or one calculation. So they give you the whole question to work through and then they can ask you any particular question. Uh, module four is worth 18% of the exam, three and a quarter hour exam, so one fifth of that. So, but they have to cover assets, liabilities, DTAs, DTLs, and revaluation. So that the idea of giving you one question on recruitment is not a proper allocation of that 18%. Uh, Michael, so the CA and TB of cash are both always the same normally. Um, yeah, I think if I think I understand that properly, yeah, if you're if you're doing it for cash purposes, um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. And you might have to clarify it a little bit further. So now we look at a liability. Tax base, carry amount minus the future uh, deductible amount. And this is where things get tricky. And the reason why, often in the tax books, you have nothing. Now, provisions. If you have a provision for an employee entitlement, in accounting, you recognize the expense and you recognize an employee provision. But for tax, there is no expense, there is no provision, it's zero. So that's going to create the temporary difference. And the same thing might happen if um, you've prepaid an asset or, well, that's, that's assets, not liabilities, but if you have um, received income in advance, you might have received income in advance for accounting purposes, you've called it a liability, but for tax purposes, there's no liability it's recognized as income immediately. So here's Barber Limited, uh, and hopefully you've worked through it. But this is where people get stuck. Why? Because they're looking for the tax liability amount and it doesn't even exist. So if Barber Limited gets $3,000 in advance and 100% of this amount was included in taxable profit, what that means is when you got the cash, it had to be recognized as income immediately for tax purposes. But for accounting purposes, it was a liability. So for accounting purposes, $3,000 liability called income in advance, the unearned revenue. So in the accounting books, debit cash, credit liability. But in the tax books, debit cash, credit income, there is no liability, therefore there is a zero tax base. So when we compare our accounting liability, customer advance, to our tax base of zero, there will be a temporary difference. So there will have to be a deferred tax item in this scenario. What will that deferred tax look like? Well, in our accounting books, we have a liability of 3000. In our tax books, we have no liability. So our difference is 3000 times the tax rate. And this is going to be a deferred tax asset. The tax office forced us to recognize that of income immediately, and therefore we're gonna pay more tax now. But later on, we don't have to pay that tax. So we will pay less tax later when this accounting item is recognized. So when we actually earn the money for accounting purposes, we'll recognize that as profit, but we won't pay tax on that profit because we've paid it now. So we'll get that benefit. All right. So unearned revenue, this is the technical way of, of spacing it out. This is an unearned revenue liability tax rate. Looking at the tax base equals the carrying amount minus the revenue not taxable in the future. Why is it not taxable in the future? Because you've already paid tax on it now. So $50 of interest revenue received in advance, but taxed on a cash basis. Now, remember what I said about reading the case facts carefully. This is the key. If revenue is received and taxed when earned, then the accounting treatment and the tax treatment will be the same and there will be no temporary difference. So you have to read the case facts. Just because you got revenue in advance does not create a DTA. Only when it says taxed on the cash basis. It's the same with prepayments. It's the same. You have to read these questions carefully. Um, Someone said, is tax book use a cool accounting module quiz two question? You'll have to explain that to me a little bit further, but we don't do much tax stuff at all in module two. You learn module two, p &L OCI, and only later do we come on to deferred taxes. Yeah, so in the future, you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll recognize a DTA now, and then when you use up that income, you'll, you won't pay any tax. And because you haven't paid tax, that DTA will end disappear, you will have taken advantage. It's like having a, a little 
docket or a ticket. Here's my $50 off my tax. But once you've handed it over, credit to the DTA because now it's eliminated. All right. So uh, if, if I can just get a like a thumbs up or I've got that unearned revenue will usually create a temporary difference, a DTA, because for tax purposes, you have to recognize the income now. But you will read that question very carefully to avoid the tricks. All right. That's looking good. Uh, as, uh, yeah. All right. So one thing, when you the study guide's a bit tricky here. It says, time to recognize a DTL. Here are two exceptions. Goodwill. And you're like, I don't even know what Goodwill is. We haven't done Goodwill to Module 5, but they put it in Module 4. That's okay. You can handle it. Goodwill would create what we call a circular disaster if you recognize the DTL. Goodwill is an unidentifiable intangible asset. It is the residual after you've worked out the fair value of all the other assets. So what happens is when we do a business combination, when we recognize assets, if their fair values move and the tax values don't, we have a temporary difference. If we pay goodwill, we will create technically a DTL, a deferred tax liability. But if you recognize the deferred tax liability, it will change the calculation of goodwill, which will change the DTL, which will mean you have to redo. So you would then for the rest of your life be calculating a different amount of goodwill and you would never do the transaction. So you can't recognize a DTL for goodwill. It doesn't make any sense in module four. Just remember it when you get to module five. Number two, and this we have a beautiful question on this and I hope it trip you up because if we trip you up, you won't make the same mistake in the exam. I think it's a laptop, $400 versus $380. What's the tax base or the temporary difference? And everyone gets it wrong. And then they send me an email and say, it's this. Da, 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 da. But if an asset has the carrying amount of 100, but a maximum tax deduction of 60, guess what? The carrying amount and the tax base at the start are not equal. So therefore, you can't have a temporary difference that then reverses because they will always be $40 different. That is what I call a permanent difference. And it says, if that happens, don't recognize the detail in this situation. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Karen. <laughs> I will try. A, lo a lot of what I'm covering is stuff I've already covered, but it is easier when you've got a chat box and, and you can um, solve problems step by step and, and, and going through it, I find. So my last bit for today, recruitment. You have to understand DTA and DTL, and then you start playing with tax losses and a couple of basic rules. And our flow chart takes you through this. First, recoup the tax losses where you haven't recognized the DTA, bring them to life and eliminate them instantly. And then if you've watched Harry Potter, I like to think of the Phoenix. The Phoenix comes along and then it burns up and goes. Um, I've got lots of useless metaphors like that. Only then do we allocate the remainder of the tax losses? So of course, if you get a multiple choice question, they will probe you to make sure you understand this rule. Now, here is the journal uh, process. So when we have a basic DTL, debit DTE, credit DTL. And then when we have a uh, DTA, in the normal situation, debit to the asset, credit DTI. See, we've got that debit and that expense, like I said, but they're interchangeable. But now, if we have an unused tax loss, we either get to um, recognize it like this, or if it's unrecognized, we have to bring it to life and eliminate it in one go. Now, if we bring it to life and eliminate it in one go, we actually, it's, it's the same journal entry. It's just two journals collapsed into one. It's this credit current tax income goes here and this debit to deferred tax expense goes here because it's a bit like if, do you remember your year eight mathematics when you have two fractions? We have a debit to DPA at the top. That's recognizing the asset. And then we're immediately de-recognizing the asset because we're using it up. So if we have a debit and a credit to DTA, they eliminate each other. So we can collapse two journal entries into one. So that's why we journal it. Uh, the way that we do. And so what we do is in one year, you've had a tax loss, but you can't recognize that tax loss. Okay, then the next year you have a profit. Great. We are going to debit the DTA, recognize our asset, credit current tax income. It's in this current year. And then we're going to immediately use it up, 
debit deferred tax expense credit to the DTA. Um, and, and that's how we, we deal with it. So uh, that Zebra Limited, I, Zebra Limited is probably, look, Circus Limited is based on question 4.7, which is very, very tough. Um, but Zebra Limited is a fairer question, a more reasonable level of difficulty. So go through Zebra a couple of times, slowly, slowly, then have a look at Circus, then look at 4.7. Um, Adam, I'll have to have a look in, um, let, I'll come back to the quiz in just a sec because I'm on my second last slide, the, the chat box. Then we get to part C. Now part C is kind of complicated, but kind of easy because you are only going to get a couple of different types of scenario. You are going to get a story where there is an asset and it's being revalued and it's going to be recovered through use. That just means using it up. If it's a vehicle, you're going to drive it around. If you're going to do that, you follow these formulas. And then they're 99% the same. You might think, oh, they're exactly the same, but they're not. This one is tax cost minus accumulated tax depreciation, whereas this is like CGT cost base minus accumulated depreciation. This one is full revalued amount. This is revalued amount limited to cost. So if you have this flow chart ready to go and you read the case facts of a question, oh, it's going to be recovered through sale. Has a G, is CGT capital gains tax applicable or not? If it's applicable, use this formula. If it's not applicable, use this formula. And then if it's a non-depreciable asset, okay, something like land. Land is pretty much a non-depreciable asset. It doesn't go down in value. Then you use this set of formulas. So read, and we've got a whole bunch of scenarios. There's some cranes, there's coal limited, there's a putt-putt, there's a golf course, and, and check those out. But uh, complicated, yes, but learn it identify, go through every question and look for those key case facts and then you have to get it right. You can't you can't not get it right. And then the key thing then for this exam is number one, be able to find the key facts. Two, use the right formula. Three, be fast. And the only way to get fast is to go through the questions now and then in two weeks time do them again and then in two weeks time do them again. And that's why I say module four takes 40 hours. If you put in those 40 hours in this specific way, there is nothing that they can ask you that you can't answer. So, so it's sort of easy and hard mixed together. And the one the one area that people get tripped up all the time in part C is when they get these case facts. So the tax rate applicable if the land is sold is 20%. They purchase non-depreciable land. The tax rate derived from the use of the land is 30%. Management intend to continue using the land. Perfect question that trips everyone up. Okay, so you're going to use the land and the rate's 30%. Simple. No, it's not simple because there's this obscure paragraph that says 51B of ISS 12 says for non-depreciable assets, you have to use the tax consequences applicable for sale regardless of the intention of management. There you go. So any question you get, if you're ready for that, and, and that's why some people walk out of this exam and they go, oh, that was so easy. Because they get a question, non-depreciable asset, da, 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 da. They go straight to the correct answer while everyone else is getting tangled up in a mess. Um, so look out for those little tricks, learn them, practice them. Don't make the, the mistake multiple times. All right, let me, I'll go through the questions here. Yeah. Uh, my problem is fine with doing the quizzes for module four at the time now in module five and you feel <laughs> exactly. Um, interestingly, we had a filming day today and we filmed a whole bunch of quizzes of uh, videos, but more about studying technique, not about um, technical accounting. And one of the things is you read something and then six weeks later it's gone. And the only way to keep it in your mind is to, to go over it. And, and one of the reasons today I did a little bit of module one, two and three is to just give you that, oh yeah, I remember that. So you actually have to look at it and then every week, every second week, go over that. Now, the great thing with module five is it has a bunch of deferred taxes once you start dealing with the the, um, the consolidation process. So we'll bring back module four and we, we re-emphasize that. Um, don't feel bad. That's exactly how people learn. But take good revision notes and summary notes so you don't have to read the whole study guide again. But that's perfectly normal. Um, example 4.16. I don't understand why we have a detail when we add back the interest revenue um, I'll, I'll have to have a look at it, 
because yeah, the, the, the flowcharts are helpful. I'll see if I can bring up that example. Um, I'll do it at the end so that way other people can head off if they need to. I've got the PDF. I'll um, let me see if I can. So that's example 4.16. Uh, okay, just you might already be into presentation. So you're looking, just one thing to keep in mind, you're in part D. People confuse the presentation of the financial statements with the calculations of deferred tax. So that's a separate thing again. Um, I reckon the best thing to do maybe fire off an email. If you've got an email, I mean, the best, ask the expert forum is the best place to do it. So, so post that question and ask the expert forum and then we'll get back to you. Um, Thiash and Vandia used to work for us. He sometimes still helps out. He created these flowcharts by reading through the standards and then trying to simplify them as best as possible. So if you read the case facts and work through the flowchart, you, you get to the right answer. They're, they're extraordinary. Um, he, he worked with us, then he went to CPA, then he came back to us, and then he actually went to work for the um, ASP, I think, working on the standards. He, he worked for one of the accounting bodies, which was just, for us, sensational. That One of our team members was, was good enough to do that. Um, question 4.8, why we calculate the deferred tax of 80,000? Let me, I'll see if I can have a quick look at that while we're talking. Um, are the MCQs we do in the module fair representation? Yes and no. So there's the module four questions. Then there's a revision quiz on module four, which is incredibly complicated. And I would say way too hard for a regular MCQ. But yeah, our MCQ, so most of our questions and webinar tasks are just different scenarios of what you've already covered in the questions. Like Circus Limited is the same as 4.7, for example. Um, Debra Limited is a simpler example of that. So there's only so much you can be asked in a CPA exam. I'm going to only give you a DTA or a DTL or or whatever it might be. When you do our mid-semester test, there's about six to eight steps sometimes in our calculation. So I think ours are a little bit tougher in that we will give you multiple steps to calculate. And if you make one error in one spot, you're all wrong. So I think ours are pretty tough. And our, you know, normally like our practice exams, let's say the MCQ section is worth about 42. And most people who get like the average is about 26. Most people get above 20 or so get through the final exam. So it gives you a good indication. You know, if you, if you can get half of them right and understand them, but look out for silly mistakes, you should be fine. Um, question 4.8. Uh, I'll, I'll have to take that on notice just to, or people can stick around and see. Um, let me Because I, I just don't want to take up too much of people's time reading on for a while. But you've asked for the 80,000. Uh, you've asked uh, why the deferred calculate deferred tax expense of eighty thousand. There's a there's a deferred tax asset, an aggregate of temporary differences. Why are they telling you eighty grand? I'll see. I'll have to have a look to see where that calculation comes from. Although it's um, it's showing you the calculation it was based on the ninety thousand adjusted to the 40 percent tax rate, but. I'm not being much help here. All right. Um, I've gone for quite a while. So thank you very much for coming along. Hope you found it useful. If you've got any final questions, ask away, and I'll either be able to answer them or um, take them on notice, and we can always post them in Facebook. So are they in, can we access the, to this recording? Yep, yeah, we'll publish this recording. We record everything. Uh, do we get much questions regarding reversal of DTA? Oh, look, pretty much the, the study guide, the exam has to follow the weightings of the objectives in the study guide. So there's a little bit on reversals, there's a bit on recognition, and then that movement. So yes, be comfortable with doing the movements. Um, less about let's do a reversal, and more about what is the movement in the DTAs and DTLs, because they're always going up and down, because some are being reversed in a given period and some are going up. So if you look at the movement, you'll see quite a few questions we give you on that. Um, is the semester exam a fair rep? To give you an idea, I did the CPA financial reporting exam in the year 2000, and it was difficult. So, but my memory is not that good. I couldn't tell you if the mid-semester exam is um, fair, but the average on the mid-semester test is a bit less than seven out of 15, and the average person passes the CPA exam. So I'm going to say ours is a little bit tougher because, you know, if the average person gets seven and passes, that, sh that shows you the what's expected. Um, the journal entry for the reversal, yeah, you'll, you'll see that with, it's just the movement. So if DTAs have gone up, 
debit ETF. They've gone down, it'll credit. Um, so look for the, the idea of movement rather than reversal. All right, have a great night, everybody. If you've still got questions, uh, can we have the slides with the PDF? Um, maybe with the PDF, although if you may notice all these PDFs are just, I've grabbed key bits from all my different webinar presentations, but happy to do that. Yeah, throw, if you've got any questions, put in Facebook or use the Ask the Expert um, forums. What score you had? What score you had? Uh, interestingly, financial reporting was my um, weakest link. I I was getting hired. I'm very good at things like management accounting and strategy and financial reporting and tax. So I have to work far too hard. So I actually got a pass for this 20 years ago. But um, after that, I actually became a, a teacher and lecturer in financial reporting. So uh, I then went and learned it all inside out. I'm like, oh, that's all the stuff I didn't learn in my CPA semester. So uh, <laughs> um I might, Jack, have a look at five, six, and seven. A lot of what I've covered is in the recordings, but I think I might, if I if we get online and we help people get through just the most difficult hurdles, happy to see if we can make that work. Karen, Ask the Expert Forum is in going to guided learning. On the top right above your contents, there's a green button called Ask the Expert. You can ask it there. Um, yeah. If, if you can, uh, no, if you can get the conclusions, and, and you'll see this, some of the videos CA produced use a slightly different technique for accumulated depreciation in Module 5 consolidations. Um, it doesn't matter. You can use that method. You can use the other method. As long as you can get to the solution, that's fine. Um, for example, in all of our content, we use the extended tax base calculation formula. CPA use a truncated one, but it doesn't always work. So we don't use it. We don't like it. Um, when you use... One account for deferred tax and post. Uh, yeah, I would personally do that, but um, when it's a debit, you've got to call it a DTA. When it's a credit, call it a DTL. Otherwise, that's just keep an eye. I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk that in the CPA exam. Where would you create the account? They, like if I'm in QuickBooks, it's just an asset account called deferred tax, um, deferred tax asset slash liability. And if it's in a positive balance then it's an asset. And if it gets to negative, then it'll be a liability. So uh, the same is like my GST payable account is always that. It's it's always a um, a floating asset or liability depending on where the GST sits. Um, so you can classify it as either or you just move it. So if I'm in QuickBooks, I just literally go in and move it to the, uh, the balance sheet, um, to the asset section or the liability. I don't like seeing negative liabilities when I prepare reports for users. So if I have a, um, a GST amount and it's actually receivable, I'll push it up into the asset part of the balance sheet. Are the learning tasks outside of my old by KE? The, they, the ones in my old are created by CPA to help people through, um, but sometimes they don't have detailed solutions. So we've put them in guided learning as well. Um, yep, Adrian, we can do that. And often the best thing to do, ask your questions and um, in Facebook. And if, if we need to, we'll run another session. So cool stuff. All right. Uh, I will, a couple of people I didn't answer when it was that, you know, post that question about 80,000, just straight into Facebook. And then I can have a proper look at it and type a sensible reply rather than trying to make it up as I go along. So uh, have a great night. Thanks for coming along. Cheers.